So I'll be speaking on borsuk Coulomb theorems into higher dimensional codomains. Uh, this is joint work with Jonathan Bush and Florian Frick. Jonathan Bush is on the call right now. He's one of my graduate students at Colorado State. And the corresponding paper, or at least the first paper on this topic, has appeared just this year um, with a different title. Um, when I submitted this title to Alexander, he, he mentioned, oh, you know, very appropriate for this seminar. And I didn't fully know the history, but uh, Stanislaw Ulam, one of the namesakes of the borsuk Ulam theorem, uh, has a rich history at CU Boulder. So he was a faculty member there in the 60s, and then later he returned as a chair. Um, Clicking on his Wikipedia page really impressed me in terms of how much uh, mathematics he has done. Uh, his name's on the Erdős Ulam problem. This is the question of, is there a dense set of points in the plane where every distance between a pair of points is rational? It's along the lines of discrete geometry as, as Harley talked about in the algebraic, algebraic combinatorics uh, 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 training seminar a few weeks ago. Um, he was part of the Manhattan Project so he helped work a lot on developing nuclear bombs. So nuclear pulse propulsion was in part created by him. And the teller Ulam design is a design for an H-bomb, I suppose. In some parts of the world, the Kolatz conjecture is called the Ulam conjecture. So the Kolatz conjecture is, you know, you take an integer and if it's odd, you multiply by three and add one, I believe. If it's even, you divide by two. And the question is, you know, do you always get back to um, some stopping uh, to one? suspect. He helped about invent cellular automaton and also the Monte Carlo method for computation. So I thought of him as a topologist, but he's clearly much, much more than a topologist. Uh, the Monte Carlo method is named uh, the Monte Carlo method because his uncle used to request money from uh, his relatives to go gamble at the Monte Carlo casino in Monaco. So I don't know if any of the folks on the Boulder call uh, have more stories about Ulam, but I'd be interested to hear them. All right, so my plan is to go through four parts. The first part, I just want to describe the classical borsuk ulam theorem. And then I'll describe briefly the borsuk ulam theorem into lower dimensional domains. Most of the time will be spent on our work on borsuk ulam theorems into higher dimensional domains. And then I want to end with a question about sure polynomials. John Bush on the call realized this connection to sure polynomials. I don't know much about sure polynomials. I'm uh, not an alge algebraic person, um, but some of you are algebraic folks. And uh, if you're interested in, in helping us out, we, uh, we could probably use some help. So what does the borsuk ulam theorem say? You're given a continuous map F from a, a sphere into Euclidean space. So I've exhibited this map of my sphere by sort of folding it up into the horseshoe shape, but it's really flattened all the way down into the plane. So this is the case n equals two that I've drawn here. All maps in this talk will be continuous. We're topologists at the seminar for today. Uh, there's two versions of the borsuk ulam theorem. They're equivalent, they're stated as bullet one, or uh, bullet two below, although I haven't completed either bullet yet. But, but the first version is the, is the one you're most familiar with. The borsuk ulam theorem says that you have antipodal points, so x and negative x, on exact opposite sides of the sphere that get mapped to the same spot in Euclidean space. So down in Euclidean space, f of x coincides with f of negative x. Okay, so I can um, fill in my answer here. Given a map, a continuous map from the n sphere into n dimensional Euclidean space, there exists a point where f of that point is equal to f of its antipode. This is often phrased in terms of temperatures and pressures. So suppose that temperature and pressure both vary continuously on the globe. Well, that gives you a function from the surface of the Earth to 2D, just mapping our location to um, its ordered pair, temperature and pressure. And so this theorem says that there's um, antipodal points on the globe, say Fort Collins and the exact opposite spot, that have the same temperature and pressure. So we don't know which two points on the Earth 
satisfy that condition, but no matter what the weather is today, there's always antipodal points on the, on the globe with the same temperature and pressure. Henry, can I ask a question? This is James. Yes, James. Yeah, so my question is, I would have thought that antipodal needs a geometry, some kind of metric, but maybe there's a topological description. In, in the sense, is continuous enough, or do I need like diffeomorphisms or some kind of other geometric thing? No, you don't, you don't need um, diffeomorphisms. Continuous is enough. Antipode, as I've described here, feels very geometric. We're sort of reflecting through the origin. But there, this theorem is also true in, in a much more algebraic context where you just have spaces equipped with uh, like free Z mod 2Z actions. So involutions on your space. Um, so long as you have involutions on your space, you can get versions of this theorem. Yeah, so it, so it is more topological than, than geometric. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the interruption. It's hard to know if you're talking to yourself or not. All right. Version two of this theorem, the version one and theorem, version two are equivalent, but version two is much more convenient for many contexts. So we're only going to look at odd maps. Odd maps are one where f of um, negative y is equal to negative f of y for all y that are inputs. So that, that's what it means to be odd. And the Borsuk-Ulam says that if you have an odd map from the n-sphere then to n-dimensional space, then there exists some input point that maps to the origin. Okay, so let me quickly explain to you why these two statements are equivalent. Why does one apply to? Well, um, by one, we know that there's some point on the sphere that maps to the same spot where it's antipode maps. And then if F is also an odd map, F of negative X is equal to negative F of X. And now what does it mean for F of X to equal negative F of X? That just implies that f of x is the origin. And why does 2 imply 1? Well, what you'll do is you're in the setting of 1. So you have some function that's not necessarily odd. But you create an odd map as such. OK, so f is not necessarily odd. But f of x minus f of negative x now is odd. And then you apply two to this odd map, you get that there's some x that maps to the origin. And, and since this, this difference function is mapping to the origin, that means that f of x is equal to f of negative x. Are you all on board? I'm sort of going to be working more with this odd formulation in the talk than the standard version you've heard of. Yeah. All right. Okay, just some comments on the proof quite quickly. The, um, the proof in the case of um, one dimensional spheres is the intermediate value theorem. You look at your favorite point y, if it maps to zero, you're done. If not, then f has some positive value and we'll, we'll prove the odd formulation. So that means that its antipode has some negative value. And then, you know, since this map is continuous, um, you can find some x in between that maps to zero. Uh, the general case uses cohomology to prove. So pretend that you miss the origin. So you have an odd map. Pretend that you miss the origin. Okay, that's, we're doing a proof by contradiction. If you miss the origin, you can radially project to get a map to the n minus one dimensional sphere. So this is sending a point x to f of x divided by its norm. OK. And then the fact that this map f was odd means that it induces a map on the corresponding projective spaces. And then you look at the cohomology of the projective spaces. Cohomology is contravariant, so you get a map on cohomology going in the reverse direction. The cohomology rings of these projective spaces are known. There, um, I'm taking cohomology with coefficients in F2, the field with two elements. Um, you know, they're polynomial rings generated by B here on the right, except I have this relation where B to the nth power is zero. 
you can look at the fundamental group to show that the generator B for one-dimensional cohomology maps to this generator A for one-dimensional cohomology. These are maps of rings, so that means that B to the N maps to A to the N. And this is our contradiction, because B to the N is zero in this ring on the right, but A to the N is not zero in this ring on the left. So we can't have a map of rings mapping zero to something non-zero. That's our contradiction. So we couldn't have missed the origin in the first place. Questions on that? All right. Is there a question? No. I was just about to say, I think we are all fine. Cool. So let me quickly talk about a little history here. Um, what are versions of this theorem when you map into lower dimensional space? So I have a picture, the two-dimensional sphere mapping to the real line, some lower dimensional space. This is called uh, Gromov's waste inequality. Um, and the statement is as follows. You expect more collisions to happen. And what you get is you get a point Y whose pre-image is, is relatively um, large in volume. Okay, so what I've drawn here is the pre-image of Y. So the statement is um, you get a point Y such that the volume of the pre-image is at least as large as the volume of an equator of the right dimension. So that S n minus k is just an equator of dimension n minus k. In this example, n minus k is two minus one or one. So I'm, I'm comparing the volume of a pre-image to the volume of this equatorial circle. And I find a point y whose volume is at least as large as the volume of that equatorial circle here, or more generally sphere. So this must need some kind of metric then or something to describe volume. Oh yes, so classical Borsuk-Ulam you should think is very continuous. This is a very geometric statement as I'll try to describe. So the proof for k equals one when you're mapping to the real line is quite easy. Um, it's really just the uh, intermediate value theorem again plus the isoparametric inequality. So, so what you do is you um, you consider the volumes of, of the region, um, oh, can't shade so well. Uh, you consider this volume under the, under the uh, level set, okay? And as you raise Y, eventually you reach a Y where half the volume is under the sublevel set, okay? That's using the intermediate value theorem. And then you use an isoparametric inequality on the sphere to get that if you have a region of the sphere containing half of the volume, then its boundary must be at least as uh, large as this circle. So James is definitely right. This isoparametric inequality is, is all geometry. Um, Your question too? Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Yeah, the, um, so for the k equals n case, uh, just remind me that S0 we're thinking of as two points, right? So that volume would be like, just the fact that there's two points and that's how we recover the borsuk ulam theorem as a special case? That's right. So it doesn't quite recover the borsuk ulam theorem it's in all its glory in the case n equals k because you, you get that you get two points, um, but you don't get that those two points are antipodal. Oh, okay. So it's like weaker, but also stronger. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's not a strictly a generalization. Um, oh. Yeah, there's interesting questions you can ask deeper there. Um, so let me talk about the k bigger than or equal to one proof just really briefly. Uh, the point is, is that it's 100 pages of geometric measure theory. Um, really hard stuff. So, you know, in our department, I think uh, Olivier Pinot is probably the, uh, the expert. Um, Longgren proved this first relatively recently. Um, you can give more topological proofs but they're hard topological proofs. You're using characteristic classes, you know, of, of vector bundles.
Um, it's, it's an interesting mix of both topology and geometry. You know, isoparametric inequality was proven a long time ago. It's exclusively geometry. This is a mix of both topology and geometry. One way of saying that is that this theorem implies the invariance of dimension. So what is invariance of dimension? Invariance of dimension says that Euclidean space of dimension K is homeomorphic to Euclidean space of dimension K prime if and only if K is equal to K prime. Seems obvious, right? Two spaces are homeomorphic if and only if they have the same dimension, but it's hard to prove. I think the first proofs were really using things like homology theory. If you had a homeomorphism, you can remove a point from each space. You have a homeomorphism now between these punctured spaces, which retract onto spheres. And then wait, you can't get a, a homeomorphism between spheres of different dimensions because their homology, group, homology groups are different. So this Gromov's waste inequality is much, much harder than invariance of dimension, much, much harder than isoparametric in inequality. But the fact that it's related to both is saying it's a, it's a complicated mix of both geometry and topology. More questions here? All right. So I'm 20 minutes in and we're to the main meat of the talk. I want to talk about versions now into higher dimensions. So we're going to consider versions of the Borsod-Coulomb theorem for maps from n spheres into higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. We're only going to consider odd maps. You could phrase all this when your maps are not odd, um, but it's slightly easier to phrase if your maps are odd. Again, the map being odd just means that there's a symmetry with respect to its reflection through the origin. You know, so if you reflect through the origin, you get the same point back. Maria, this uh, generalization that John and Florian and I do, this does recover the Borsod-Coulomb theorem in the case n equals k. So it is a generalization in that sense. Cool. All right, so what are we looking for? I have a, an odd map here from the circle into some higher dimensional space. I'm mapping the circle into 2D, and clearly I missed the origin. Okay, so there's, it seems like there's no generalization, right? I missed the origin. Uh, the theorem doesn't generalize. What we're going to look at, however, is, is sets of bounded diameter, hopefully small diameter in some sense, where when I map those sets over, so call this, you know, x, x prime, and x double prime, when I map those points over, I have x double prime, x, x prime. The origin is contained in the convex hull. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for sets of small diameter that contain the origin in the convex hull. Um, an important remark is that, so we're gonna, we're gonna equip the circle with the path length metric. So distances are how far it takes to walk along the circle. And the, the total distance around the circle is one, okay? So the distance between this point and this point is one half. So if I have y and y prime, here the distance is one half. Interesting diameter bounds are gonna be strictly less than one half. Because if I go all the way up to diameter one half, I certainly contain the, the origin in the convex hull. Um, right, because this map is odd. So here might be f of y. Since this map is odd, f of y prime is antipodal, and the origin is, is obviously in the, in the convex hull there. So we're going to look for sets of small diameter containing the origin in the convex hull, and small diameter better be less than one half. Otherwise, we're, uh, we're not uh, worth our, uh, our uh, yeah, we're not uh, doing much. Questions so far? So is the, the inspiration for this just like, uh, well, you're kind of pushing things up into higher dimension. And so you need a convex hole to sort of thicken things up in order to, to hope to get something that you want. 
Yeah, no, no point needs to hit the origin, right? But we're trying to uh, get nearby points that sort of contain the origin in this, in this sense. Yeah. Can you say again exactly what the theorem says? Uh, like what are the yeah. conditions? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll write the theorem here and then I'll uh, talk more about um, some intuition. So the theorem, first we're gonna give the theorem in the case n equals one. So we're looking at the circle, all right? And we get versions of this theorem into all higher dimensions. So we're mapping into um, uh, odd dimensions, but, but even dimension also includes into odd dimension. So the theorem says that there exists a subset at capital X of the circle of bounded diameter. So this diameter is at most K divided by two K plus one. And you should note that that's always less than one half. And the conclusion is such that the origin is in the convex hull of this set. Okay, so what are these values? These values look like um, zero. In the case k equals um, k equals zero, that recovers the map from the circle into the real line. And there you just have antipodal points that, that uh, or a single point hits the origin. So that, that recovers the standard bohr circle theorem. And then these, these values look like one third, two fifths, three sevenths, four ninths, all strictly less than one half as you go into higher and higher dimensions. Henry, could you scroll the paper up a bit because it's getting cropped at the bottom of the theorem. Oh, thanks. How's that? Can you see the theorem? Yes, now I can see it. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Okay, right. I have, I have a ahead. question based on this, because I, I don't think you want to get into the weeds, but I'm just curious. Now you do have some kind of metric on S1. Does this yep. need to be a standard sphere? Oh, I guess it's S1. I see, you don't have any SN, so you don't have any exotic spheres. Okay, thank you. So we're soon going to get to SN, James, and we're going to equip it with the path length metric. You know, it's the standard S, SN um, in Euclidean okay. space. Okay, so no, no really horrifying stuff. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let me talk about one third. So one third appears as a diameter bound when K is one. So one third is the diameter bound when you're mapping into 3D or 2D. You can already see that you need diameter up to one third when you're mapping into 2D. Just by um, this example where I'm including the circle into 2D by the identity map. You know, certainly I don't, I don't hit the origin, but once I include collections of points of diameter one third, right? This is one third of the way around the circle. Then, then I do hit the origin in the convex hull of those three points. What's surprising is, is that one third diameter also works in 3D. So let me give you an interesting odd map into 3D. I'm gonna map theta to cosine theta, sine theta, cosine three theta, so as I go around the circle, I have three humps. So here's the first hump, and then I have the second hump, and then I have this third hump, okay? So there's my map of the circle in. And maybe, um, maybe these three points map to the, th the three uh, maxima. And no, I don't contain the origin in the convex hull. As I rotate those points, however, right, I now maybe get these three points, okay? And then eventually I rotate these points until I get these three points um, that do contain the origin in their convex hull. So one third- That's really neat. Yeah, one third is easy, pretty easy to guess by looking at the plane. 
but it's cool that one third also works into 3D as well for any odd map, not just, you know, yeah, not just the standard conclusion map. Um, two fifths, three sevenths, four ninths, those are just the diameters of more and more equally spaced points around the circle. So two fifths is coming from, take five equally spaced points on the circle. It's the diameter of this four dimensional simplex right here, right? This diameter is two fifths. So once I map up into 4D or 5D, you know, the diameter that I need to allow myself is two fifths. Okay. So when you write down a theorem like this in higher dimensions, it's a little hard to um, know whether you should be surprised or not, or whether you should be happy or not. One way in which you might be happy is if you can prove that your bounds are sharp. So in some sense, no better theorem can be proven. And that, that's the case for this theorem. So the diameter bounds are sharp. Um, and let me, let me just briefly tell you that story. So the diameter bounds are sharp not only into dimension 2k plus 1, but they're also sharp into one lower dimension, dimension 2k. And what this map is, you, is you just map the circle in by mapping your angle theta to cosine theta, sine theta. So that's just the inclusion of the circle into 2D, as we saw above. But then you continue cosine 3 theta, sine 3 theta, uh, cosine 5 theta, sine 5 theta, etc. You get you know, higher and higher odd dimensions. So consider this map into 4D. Um, yeah, consider this map into 4D, or let, let's, yeah, into 4D, all right. Um, no, um, no set of diameter strictly less than one third has its convex hull containing the origin. But, um, hold on, let me back up. Okay, so, so let's start with 2D since I messed up. In 2D, no set of, um, so I'm only using the first two coordinates. No set of uh, stri diameter strictly less than one third hits the origin, okay? And then when I go to 4D, this is a map showing that no set of diameter strictly less than two fifths hits the origin. And then when I go up into 60, this is an example showing that no set of diameter strictly less than three sevenths hits the origin. Questions? Yeah, so, um, so the diameter, you're just taking all of the path length distances and you're saying what's the biggest one? That's right. So with, um, when, you, when you're talking about one third, I mean, like pigeonhole principle says that this means if you would have to drop down to two points otherwise, right? Because if you, if you wiggle one of those points in the triangle, then it's, it's going to necessarily increase the diameter. Wait. Yeah, that's right. If you wiggle one of the points in the triangle, you, you do increase the diameter. Okay. Forget what I just said. Um, that is correct, but that's, I was thinking the, there was a different consequence coming from that. So there's, there's something called Karate Dori's theorem that says in n-dimensional space, if, if a point's in your convex hull, then it's, if a point is in the convex hull of a set, then it's in the convex hull of at most n plus one points in that set. So that's one way to get a bound on the number of points. We can actually do one better, one fewer point than that bound, actually, for this theorem. Alrighty. So let me just sketch the proof. Um, we, we came across this not by thinking about borsuk ulam theorems, but by thinking about something uh, totally different, some special complexes. So we have this map from our circle into higher dimensional space. That's gonna induce a map on a simplicial complex built on top of this space just by mapping simplices and linearly, simplices map to their convex hull. Okay, so we're gonna look at the viator strips complex of this circle. What is this? I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but it's, it's the viator strips. 
uh, simplicial complex with vertex set the circle. So every point in the circle is a, is a vertex. Um, and it contains all simplices of diameter, whatever parameter um, we put here, R, what, whatever parameter we put here. When R is small, this space is a uh, homotopy equivalent to a circle, okay? That's for R small. But once you get up to one third, which I'll write as K over two K plus one, where, uh, where K is one, right? So once you get up to diameter K over two K plus one, this space is homotopy equivalent to a two K plus one sphere. So once you get up to scale one third, or K is one, this space is homotopy equivalent to a three sphere. And then you can just apply the standard Borsuk-Ulam theorem to this map. All right. So then now we have a map between a sphere and Euclidean space of the same dimension. So we can apply standard Borsuk-Ulam theorem to get two points in this sphere that collide and that translates into a, um, a set of diameter at most k over 2k plus 1 that, uh, that collides with its antipode, or I should say that hits the origin since we're talking about odd maps. I don't want to dwell on this proof, but uh, questions? All right. We have weaker versions for um, ar arbitrary spheres, but we can't go into high, arbitrarily high co-dimension. We can only go into co-dimension one, you know, usually the standard Borsuk-Ulam theorem is SN into RN. We only have results so far from SN into RN plus one or RN plus two. So the diameter bound that appears is, um, is, let me state the theorem. So for F odd, there exists a subset X of the n-dimensional sphere of diameter at most Rn, where R2 is this length of this inscribed, uh, this edge on this inscribed tetrahedron in the two sphere, such that the origin is in the convex hull of that set. So you can see that this bound is sharp just by looking at the inclusion map um, from the two sphere into 3D. You know, that's the smallest diameter where you first hit the origin. What's cool is that this bound works not only into 3D, but also into 4D, and not only for the inclusion map, but for, for any odd map. Um, and the proof is, as you might expect, you look at the Vitor strip simplicial complex containing, you know, we're looking at collections of all sets of at most this diameter. These are not spheres. These Vitor strip complexes are not spheres, but their homotopy groups vanish in the same dimensions that homotopy groups of spheres vanish. So I sort of wish I had the um, n plus two sphere here, right? Because then I could apply the standard Borsuk-Ulam theorem. I don't have the n plus two sphere, but I have a space that, that the first n plus one homotopy groups vanish. And so the Borsuk-Ulam theorem still applies in that setting. So we can, since we have a, a space with the right connectivity, we can apply the Borsuk-Ulam theorem. Questions? So the generalization of this R2 is to sort of higher dimensions. You're inscribing the sort of appropriate dimensional simplex inside the sphere? That's right. So the three sphere, instead of, so here we're inscribing a tetrahedron inside the two sphere. 
the this Rn, the way it goes up is you're inscribing a um, four simplex into the three sphere, and you're looking at the edge length of that four simplex, that regular cool. four simplex. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let me give some remarks, and then we'll get to part four. So why can't we go into higher dimensional codomains? It's because we don't know these homotopy types at larger scales. One conjecture is that, you know, when do the, you know, when do the homotopy types change again? One conjecture is it's related to strongly self-dual polytopes, which are in a paper by Lovash. Lovash is a combinatorial topologist, so he does both topology and combinatorics. Um, Harley, in the same uh, talk a couple of weeks ago, talked about chromatic number of the plane. Lovash introduced strongly self-dual polytopes to, to study the chromatic number of spheres. So you take a sphere, you build a graph by including all edges of a fixed constant distance, and then you ask what's the chromatic number of that graph. He built these polytopes because the polytopes have the property that um, every vertex has a paired face. Let me do another example. Every vertex has a paired face, okay? And the lengths of the diagonals from any vertex to its paired face are the same across the entire polytope. So those blue diagonals that I just drew are the same as these purple diagonals in length. So this graph that you get is a uh, subgraph of the, uh, the graph for this chromatic problem on the spheres. Another remark, uh, Michael Crabb is a professor at Aberdeen. He's a, a topologist. He, he's used characteristic classes to get uh, some generalizations of these results. Um, same diameter bound, but he can get into slightly higher dimensions in some cases. So pretend I have a sphere of that dimension. The same Rn diameter bound can get you up um, not only dimension plus one or plus two, but roughly twice the dimension. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> I won't say too much there. Um, Henry? Yeah, James? But do you, well, how much do you need to know? Just that the homotopy groups vanish at some point, or do you really need the homotopy groups for all the intermediates? Oh no, you're, you're exactly right. We only need that the homotopy groups vanish. Um, which is actually a really good point because that, that is a uh, potential a lot easier to prove. Yeah. I think this question of what are the homotopy types of these rips complexes of spheres at larger scales, it's really interesting, but I think it's hard, but getting vanishing is, is quite likely easier. Yeah. The last remark I have here is that, um, um, the borsuk ulam is used to prove a whole bunch of different things. So necklace splittings or a radon's theorem, also the ham sandwich theorem. So whenever you generalize a borsuk ulam theorem, you ask, can I generalize versions of those other theorems? And John and I are currently thinking about things along these lines, but you can get generalizations of the ham sandwich theorem, for example. So the ham sandwich theorem says you have three sets in 3D. So bread, cheese, and ham for your ham sandwich. And you can find a single hyperplane that cuts that sandwich into two, where both James and I get the same amount of bread, the same amount of ham, and the same amount of cheese. So the, the, generalizations, um. yeah, the generalizations that we get are now when you have more fixings. So we also have lettuce on our sandwich, okay? So now we also have lettuce. A single cut no longer suffices, but if you, you allow multiple cuts, um, you can do it. And you know, the cuts are going to be close in, in, in some sense is what the diameter bound is giving. So you can find cuts that are relatively close to each other. So I have eight minutes left. I was going to sort of uh, change topics just to ask a question about sure polynomials. Questions before I do? All right.
my goal here is to get it to a question about shirt polynomials. I want to define, describe some uh, things called orbitopes first. So orbitopes are generalizations of polytopes. Polytopes, you take a convex hull of a collection of points. Orbitopes, you take a convex hull of a curve. So here we have a curve, um, right? This curve actually cosine theta, sine theta, cosine three theta that we've seen before. And in orange, we've taken its convex hull. You get all these edges and actually some triangular faces. Okay. Um, so the barvenak novik orbitope in even dimensions is the convex hull of this curve. And its faces are known only for k equals 1 or 2. Um, so k equals 1 is just the circle. And if you take the convex hull of the circle, you get the disk. And what are the faces here? They're just all the vertices on the circle. So you will only have zero dimensional faces. k equals 2 is in, in 4D. It's um, the convex hull of cosine theta, sine theta, cosine three theta, sine three theta. What are its, so the picture here I have is only a projection into 3D. What are the faces of this orbitope in, in 4D? You have all vertices on the curve, all edges up to length at most one third. So here you can see in this projection, you can see edges, some edges of length up to one third, but you need to also take all rotations of those edges. And then you also have all equilateral triangles. So in this lower dimensional projection, you can see one equilateral triangle, but in 4D, you have all rotations thereof. Okay, the Kerate Dori orbitope is the convex hull of the curve uh, cosine theta, sine theta, cosine two theta, sine two theta, three theta, four theta. So it's not only the odd powers, it's, it's all powers. And the faces are known uh, for all k. They're just all, um, all uh, sets up to size k. So in, in 2D, you just have the circle again, and it's all sets up to size 1, all vertices. In 4D, the faces of this are all edges, all sets of size 2. OK, why does this relate to sure polynomials in my last four minutes? I'm a very geometric thinker. Fortunately, my student, John Bush, is a very good algebraic thinker. So a lot of the work up above required some difficult algebra that, that uh, John was able to hold my hand through. We had to take determinants of matrices that looked like this. In fact, some of you might remember I, I wrote that top four by four matrix up in the tea room a couple years ago and Harrison um, Chapman helped us figure out the determinant. So I have two different columns. One column is where we have odd things. Um, so cosine and sine of three theta, five theta, seven theta. And the other column is where it's not odd. So two theta, three theta, four theta, five theta. And the different rows, I either have ones appended on the top or not. This first row allows you to answer things, questions like, um, is there a set of a, some bounded diameter that hits the origin? The second row allows you to determine the, the faces of the orbitopes I was talking about above. So green means determinants are easy to take for these matrices. Red means the determinants are hard to take. Um, we were able to take this determinant to get our borsuk ulam results. Other folks were able to take this determinant to get the faces of the Karate Dori orbitopes. However, the faces of the barvenak novik orbitopes, folks haven't been able to figure out this determinant well enough. So how might you take the determinants of these matrices? Well, change sine and cosine to exponentials. And then um, what do you get? In the green cases, you get a Vandermond matrix. Um, uh, whose determinant is easy to factor. 
And since you can easily factor this determinant, you can determine its sign and you can answer the relevant question, the question on either the first row or the second row. In the red cases, when you change the exponentials, you don't get a Vandermond matrix, you get a generalized Vandermond matrix. So you don't have consecutive powers, variables raised to power zero, one, two, three, and four. Some powers are skipped. So when you have a generalized Vandermond matrix, I'm not an expert in this stuff, but its determinant contains a Vandermond portion and a sure polynomial portion in its factorization. Um, one, one definition of sure polynomials, as far as I understand, is, is the, the ratio of the determinant of a generalized Vandermond matrix to the non-generalized one. So here, um, since you get this sure polynomial, the sign of that sure polynomial is hard to analyze. And so you can't figure out the size sign of the determinant and you can't answer your question. Let me give you particular examples. So the top left matrix in green, which you can only partially see, you change the exponentials, you get a Vandermond matrix, you take its determinant, you change back to sines and cosines, and the determinant of this top left matrix is just a product of sines. Quite simple. The, the bottom right example, you do the same thing, you take its determinant, and you still get a product of sines. By contrast, this red example here, you do this business and, and you compute determinants and you have a generalized Vandermond determinant, Vandermond matrix. And so the determinant has a Vandermond part, which is a product, you can figure out its sign, but you also have a sure polynomial part that includes sums, sums of cosines. Very hard to, uh, to analyze the sign of the sure polynomial part. So, that's all I know about sure polynomials. If folks are interested, we're happy to, to talk more about it and describe our questions. Why might uh, analyzing these signs of sure polynomials help us? And, uh, and I'll leave it there. So thanks so much for your, your time and attention. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, do we have questions have or remarks or solutions? Maria? Um, mostly on this last uh, slide here. So, the, um, you, when you say determine the sign, I'm just trying to understand the question. Like, you mean when you plug in various values of t, like is it positive or negative? Exactly. I see. Yeah, and this is largely John Bush's good work. So, um, for example, finding faces of this Barvenok Novik overtope or determining whether these convex hulls hit the origin, he's mm -hmm. reduced those to um, plugging variables into these matrices and seeing where the sign changes. So, you know, what variables you can plug into this matrix where the sign changes, it relates to things like, oh, this collection of points on the circle determines a face of this orbitope, mm -hmm. or, Oh, if, if um, you know, no collection of points determines the changes the sign, I guess, then you miss the origin in the convex hull, you know, things like that. I, I know there's some, um, there's some recent papers on like positivity of sure functions where you plug in values for the variables. Now, I don't know how it relates exactly here because you're like de-exponentializing and I'd have to like work through what that is, but I can yeah, yeah, yeah. the latest paper that I saw in that direction and just see if it helps. Yeah, definitely. No, we've uh, we've seen some things like this, but uh, and but we'd like to see more. And uh, it'd be nice to know. I mean, it might be the case that it's a very hard problem, right? But when you have a hard problem, it's nice to attack it from different perspectives. And shared polynomials is a perspective that I do not ever attack anything from. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, another direction that this is wrapped up in is um, the theory of orthogonal polynomials, Gegenbauer and Chebyshev polynomials often have these exact same expressions show up. I don't know what's known. I just know that you get to these things and then you throw a bunch of integrals at it. I, I, yeah, no, I, I'd like to learn more. I'd like to improve it in terms of my algebraic uh, thinking. So I'd be happy to, if folks are interested in chatting more, I'd be very happy and, and John would too. Other questions?
That does not seem to be the case. Well, then once more, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are.